Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Dan Q. Makalua. The Mian Team. Mad Jin. With guest co host Kalina. You've listened to an episode, right? Uh, nope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you're about to listen to one now, so to speak. Uh, yeah. yeah. Welcome to number 279. I'm your guest for today, Kalina, or Callie for short, and I'm joined by the regular co host, Dan Q. Cool as a cucumber. Imagine. I'm wondering why Dan has a fetish with cucumbers. Makalua? I don't know. I, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. No, no. <laughs> and the me and team. Officially your secondary source for ethical gameplay in Civ. I would like to commend Phil for not continuing on with whatever this <laughs> cucumber <laughs> thing is. Of six buildings. Well, I recommend that if all the buildings, there's one you should pretty much always build, and that one's the palace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if you don't build it, you're probably not going to win. But elsewise, for the city center district, monument. When you should you pick this as your top pick? The only time I'm not constructing a monument is if I'm Rome, and then they're automatically built for me. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Would you delay your first settler for a monument? For example, uh, depends. I would only because the first settler could potentially be later. It's just a question of am I hacking out a settler so that I can get to early empire faster via two cities getting to six pop and then spamming more settlers, or am I being forced to wait for that because I don't have enough necessary forests or other stuff that I can quick chop to get a settler out versus doing other things and therefore need more culture to get through civics a little faster. There's also the barbarian quotient. Yeah. <laughs> and other yeah. zip quotient, both. You'll want to win a settler race if you're going to bother engaging in a settler race. And yeah. yes, you do need units both for your opponents and for barbs. <laughs> but also, sometimes, say, if you're on an islands map, you don't really have a place to go right away. And barbs <laughs> aren't really, no they're, they're nowhere near the early consideration either in that case. That's true. Unless you have space to expand on your own island, you are locked out at a shipbuilding, which is a late classical tech, before you can actually get anywhere and get a city up. So you need your culture up so you can get to, say, political philosophy a little bit faster and get other sorts of uh, bonuses in. Or, say, run to theater squares just so that you can get more culture and plow differently. So the monument actually slips in there naturally. Yeah, um, not a lot to mention... Of- viable builds otherwise really <laughs> yeah the faster you get to the first one for the trade route that's also the one that gives you the shipbuilding bonus for ancient and classical so if you're going to hit sailing quick you need to get into that quick as well so that you're not spending 10 turns trying to build the first galley but then again i usually prioritize builders over monuments for the initial thing yeah I'm often thinking about it, but, you know, an initial build or in addition to the consideration of settler and monument, there's also the question of scouts, which if you know you're on an island's map, then that's (laughs) that's definitely (laughs) not a priority. (laughs) Yeah, normally I would say, I mean, if you're not on an island map, build or scout, because no one's going to build a monument very, very first thing, unless you have a very specific goal in mind for, say, you're playing China and you want to hit the Oracle or something like that then you would probably want to get a monument up earlier to get the culture rolling earlier so that you can get access to it. But other than that, it wouldn't be first. And it's also possible, although more situational, that if you happen to come across a cultural city-state and you're the first one there and you've got an automatic envoy, that could also contribute to the delay to the construction of a monument because you're getting culture input otherwise. Yeah. But as Majin mentioned, getting the culture up so you can get to political philosophy so that you can start working more social policies to be specific to your situation is a reason why I'm often sitting there thinking, okay, all else being equal, which is, you know, a, a very nice vacuum statement, monument, scout, monument, scout. I mean, the builder comes in there as well. It also depends on what terrain I have. And it's like, okay, can I actually construct a builder and improve something once the builder is constructed? Because I've made that mistake before where it's, oh, 
darn, my builder now has to wait a few turns <laughs> because I didn't finish the mm-hmm. twiddle thumbs, attack. twiddle thumbs. <laughs> I got a little bit ahead of myself there. But of course, if there's something that you can farm right away, excellent. Then also influencing what technology I'm going for. It's like, oh, I'd like to be able to chop that forest. Okay, I need to go to mining. Why do I want to chop the forest? Oh, am I back to, is it a monument? Is it a set? I think I've mentioned this before. I'm often buying slingers, my initial income to help out with the barb situation. So I'm not building units specifically at that point, unless it happens to be a settler. Yeah, I'm usually of a preference to buy the first settler if possible. If you get above 10 gold per turn pretty quick, then buying the first one rather than hacking woods for it. And as you said, above 10 gold per turn, my first thought was, hi, commercial city state. Hi there. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Is you find a couple of those, are awesome. Yeah, it's like, oh, am I the first envoy? Oh, that's great. That's plus four gold. Oh, hey, can I send a trade road to you? Oh, great. That's like plus six, seven, eight gold or whatever. Hey, look at that. I'm at plus 10. I love you very much. <laughs> Segway from the capital build to other cities, because that's probably more important to talk about. Because, I mean, everybody can figure out, yes. like, do I need to make a builder because I've got, say, six improvable resources right here? Yeah, you probably should get a couple of those. I wouldn't How say important. everybody, but yes, yeah. you should. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you should build those. <laughs> no, it, it's more of a, you plant a new city away from your capital. What, where are you going to go and what's more important in the early game? Assuming that, you know, you have access to some of these things. Cause there's no point in talking about building a water mill if you don't have one tech wise. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So what's the thought on that? I used to try for water mills when I plant a new city if there's stuff because it'll add the extra production of the food and basically it just grows itself into it. Then finding those are more of a waste of hammers unless you have a lot and at which point you might as well just buy it with gold. In a newer city, is it going to be a monument? Sometimes is it a water mill or is it going to be a granary? Well, I mean, a granary is nice, but at that particular point in time, it's I'm not really so concerned about growth right now. Although, of course, it's going to be giving you extra food right from the beginning. The water mill, depend, and of course, it yes, needs to be built if your, your city center is on a river. It's the only time you can be building that. Plus one food and the plus reduction itself is nice, but it's more resource dependent. If I've got wheat and rice resources, and then, of course, those are things that I can improve right away from the beginning, then, okay, I might prioritize a water mill in that city. And I might build that instead of buying it, it you know, spending very much on my gold income. And also at this point in time, oh my gosh, there's more barbarian camps. I need a couple more slingers. Oh, I've probably gone to archery at this point. I should probably be upgrading those slingers that I have. So I'm, I'm spending my gold on the defense while I'm trying to get the production up in my next cities. Well, the difference is if you don't have rice or wheat around, then the water mill goes one more point of production over the granary. The really, the granary is just that extra one point of food isn't really worth it to care about unless you're stacking it with a water mill because then at that point you'll be able to grow a little bit better or at least pay for another population point the granary to me is like okay i'm now two away from my housing cap might as well build the granary all right so we've covered the city center what district do we want to talk about next let's go to the theater square we build that in the late industrial era when we finally need culture (laughs) (laughs) we finally need a lot of culture (laughs) <laughs> no, when we finally decide archaeology stuff is important. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, early in the game, no, no, I got other things. I'd rather build the entertainment thing. I'd rather build a campus. I'd rather build an industrial zone, a commercial hub. Oh, hey, light game. I just got archaeology. The theater district is the unique district. Like, if I'm Gargo for Greece, then... Oh, okay. Okay. And you throw it in a little earlier, obviously. I also found myself in a recent situation where I was on a small continent and there were no AIs with me and there were two cultural city-states. And so I'm banking all of these envoys and completing these quests and it's like, okay, well, I'd like to be able to use those envoys because I'm getting notifications that, and I'm at Player's Been Defeated and I'm at Player's Been Defeated. And so I'm thinking, okay, great, there goes some other city-states. Why am I sitting on all these envoys? Fine, I'm going to invest in the cultural city-states Oh, so since I've already got this investment, if I construct a theater square, then now I'm at three envoys and six envoys. There's two, four, six, eight plus more culture a turn. If I have a theater square, okay, now I can see myself constructing a theater square. Yeah. Although this does not mean that it's ahead of certainly not a commercial hub and probably not a campus, maybe not an encampment either, but okay, in that situation, then maybe rather than, you know, the later on in the game, it might be kind of mid-ish game that I'm thinking about it. But also to Mackie's point, after commercial hub, campus, and encampment, 
yeah, the entertainment complex is probably going to come ahead of a theater square just because, you know, I'd really like to keep my people happy as they're growing and I'm kind of stretched for amenities and I really don't want these rebels coming through. I'm not worried about them taking my city, but I'm kind of worrying about wrecking my stuff. So theater square, yeah, very situational. Yeah, the only other time to build it earlier is if your neighbors that you're about to beat up happen to have great works. While you may not have produced the writers or even some artists in some cases, you do need space for them to go once you, you know, borrow them from your neighbors. <laughs> I typically go into the religious side of the game. Uh... So I tend to... <laughs> now, Phil... <laughs> <laughs> I tend to prioritize a shrine and start with the holy sites because I like the whole passive, but still make everybody like me and take them all over. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Holy sites earlier than theater squares, <laughs> obviously. Oh, well, if yes. you're going for religion, obvious. Yes. yes. Yeah. Even if you're not going for religion, having some holy sites is actually decent to produce that faith. Because then you can get that yeah, the faith accumulation, and then it's like, oh, would I like to rush this great person? Well, yes. Yes, I would. <laughs> Cheaper than doing it with gold. Or would I like to get that Jesuit education over there that that person founded and bring it to my cities? Yes. Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would love to be able to use my faith to get some campus buildings. And theater square buildings. And if you happen to find Valletta for being able to buy city-centered buildings with faith, Oh, yes. And ancient walls. Then you want some faith as you expand because then you can buy up all that stuff with faith rather than gold or produce it. And it's always cheaper in faith. It's true. So you can get those cities up and running faster. And then you can go back to the monument, granary, watermill consideration and just add a third line. Well, I could use faith with this now. Or I could just buy it all. Move it on. <laughs> <laughs> like, why make a choice? You can just buy it all. <laughs> Callie, you mentioned the shrine. What's coming after the shrine? Like, what about a temple, for example? Well, of course you're going to build the temple next. You can't build anything else except for the temple next. <laughs> well, so, so I'm wondering, like, do you just stop at the shrine and be done with it? Although, given the fact that you said you're going the whole religious route, I expect not. But, you know, I don't want to make an ass option. <laughs> yeah, basically, they're just trying to continue on and then build up the missionaries to spread out. And then if somebody gets too close, I'm like, oh, hey, Inquisitor. There's a better question on the holy site. Which of the buildings do you go for? Wat, synagogue, pagoda, mosque, meeting house, gurdwara, or cathedral? I guess I typically <laughs> go with the mosque because it does have an extra spread. But then the gurdwara also has the bonus of food. So it's kind of a toss-up between those two that I tend to go for, just for those specific bonuses because you don't want to run out. Of, like I always find food and housing are a problem, so just pushing those ones. And it's probably because I choose religion over some stuff. But then this farther down the line is the state church, but it's only Norwegian. When I was doing religion early on with Civilization VI, which is kind of humorous to say, seeing as how the game hasn't been out a year yet. But anyway, <laughs> my question was often between the Warda for the plus two food, but also the what for the plus two science. Depends do... on what's around the map for me. Yeah. Well, yeah, usually. Like, like the meeting house is useful if there's not a huge amount of production available. I'm stuck in a bunch of planes. I like Gurdwara. Look <laughs> at the food thing. Because sometimes you, you do, you have a starting location or all your expansion locations are in kind of meh food areas and you want that little extra so they'll grow faster. Yeah. The synagogue, I think, not as useful long term. I mean, if you're going like crazy faith, then maybe the synagogue, if that's your only thing that you're doing. Although I guess if you're playing the game on something higher than Emperor, then the AI will probably uh, yeah, snap down. that up. <laughs> yeah, they'll Stonehenge before you can even say Stonehenge and then take it. Because they always take it first. Always. Every single <laughs> game. Hey, I like commercial hubs. Who likes money? Does everybody like money? I'm pretty sure we all money, like money. Money, money, money. <laughs> Better than Herbers. Yeah. 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 Go something for the Renaissance, something for industrial, and something for when you first start building them. The market. They have, what is it? Sukinis. For Poland. Uh huh. More gold. More things. Gold and trade route. Yeah, yeah, golden. Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. And in most cases, you should build the trade route before the buildings. Yeah, yeah depends. Most cases depends. If you have them already, yeah. If you have, I mean, if you have multiple cities, this city could build the market because it just built the commerce. Yes, commercial that's true. A different city could build the. Trade. <laughs> could take advantage. Yes. Then let me change my words. The trade route is a higher <laughs> priority, but you don't need to build it in that city. That is true. Yes. Yeah. You should be building that trade route somewhere. Yeah. And Don't leave yourself because... with, like, you know, three out of 11 trade routes for yeah. like 20. 
Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. 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 Well, it, districts I have. <laughs> commercial hub is nice, and it's kind of a set it and forget it kind of thing because you build it the first time, build the building, and then you don't have to worry until you hit the next era. Yeah, from the market to the bank to and stock exchange. Yeah, commercial hub. I mean, we've talked about this before. It's like new site. Okay, what is your district priority? And eventually, to me, it's actually no. I want a commercial hub here before I want a campus. And part of that is because, okay, so I get the commercial hub, it can start constructing these buildings, and then based on other cities that I have, it's, oh, they've already got the commercial hub and running, I want them to be constructing their buildings, but, okay, now I'm going to go and I'm going to construct the campus, I'm going to use the gold income that I'm getting from the commercial hub buildings, Mm -hmm. uh, as well as the trade routes, plus the social policies that come into and give nice boosts to the adjacency bonuses, and eventually the buildings themselves, (coughs) drool, the Enlightenment right after diplomatic service, but... It's, okay, so I'm going to use this gold to now buy some buildings that now go into other districts, such as uh, with priority on campus and industrial zone. We should cover, do not spend your gold to build buildings for the commercial hub, please. Yeah, that's the question. Is <laughs> At what point are you spending gold to get gold? Because you'd think, generally, it's a good rule not to buy buy the market when you plop down your first couple commercial hubs because, well, you just spent gold to make gold and how long will that take to pay it off? But that is a very simple mathematical equation. How much gold did you spend? You're going to get this much gold back. That means you have X number of turns before you start making money off it. But one thing that you're not adding in there is the great person side of things. Sometimes buying the market is the choice if it will give you more great people points and pass somebody else to get the great person that you want. Because merchants are actually pretty good. As much as I decry religion, the faith output, banking faith, rather use that to kind of leapfrog someone over getting a great person. Industrial. You build industrial buildings in the industrial (laughs) district and it makes your hammers better. And you should make that in a lot of your cities, but not all of them. Just like with other districts, when you're placing the district down, pay attention to the adjacency bonuses. Yep. And once that's placed, you start with a workshop. Encampment, barracks versus stables, depends on what you're building. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, more obviously <laughs> than usual. And yes, of course, the bombard capability from the encampment itself. Encampment versus theater square based on culture output. Hmm. Considering eras, you can get an amphitheater in, which will give you some culture. The theater square, unless it's going to be part of a triangle really pushing it, isn't really going to give you much in the way of culture, even the base, unless you are spamming wonders at the same time around it. But the encampment, if you work it with specialists, you can get one per specialist, and you get your choice of barracks or stables early, followed by the armory, followed by the military academy. You can get two of those before, and actually three, depending, before you even get your second theater square building. Not to mention that you also get the production from the encampment for units, but from a cultural perspective, in theory, if you're spammable of units anyways, you could almost use an encampment as a replacement for the theater square if you're not going for, say, the uh, writers or artists, at least until the art museum and the uh, archaeology museum pops in. At that point, they definitely overpower the uh, encampment for culture. If you built some encampments by then, you're probably just going to use them to win the game. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Or it probably won't be a cultural win. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're the only culture left on the map. Then... Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's true. That, that would be about how I would win a culture in Civ 6, yes. That is how I won my culture victory in Civ 6. I was brothel stopping, and before I could take the last few cities, hey, you won a cultural victory. And I must admit, my first reaction was, no! <laughs> 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 uh, I want that achievement, not this achievement. Hmm. Campus, Mm-mm. library to the university to was it the research lab? Yeah, which of yeah. course that thing that's so far away. <laughs> what is it again? I think Frax says something against research lab. It's like, yeah, we need to include it because people want it, but we don't want it to be that uh, useful for you. So this is continuing on the tradition from Civ Five. It's excellent, mm-hmm. but for the library and the university, given when they arrive and taking paying attention, of course, to the adjacency bonus is something you can construct right from the beginning. But as I mentioned before, at some point the tipping scale is no. I'm going to prioritize the commercial hub. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I would like more gold and more trade routes, which gives me more money to 
buy more things, other buildings for, for other districts, uh, units, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, there are also the great people that can tie very well into your campus districts. It's like, oh, yes, I would like my libraries to get plus one. Uh, oh, and I love my universities to get plus four. Plus, there's also finding these things called uh, scientific city-states that are going to be giving you additional science for every campus that you have. And at some point, at some point, it's like, I could be this much farther ahead in technology, but as a warmongering bastard, <laughs> I'm far enough along in the tech right now, I could really use some gold to <laughs> buy these units. We'll just acknowledge the harbor here, and maybe when we talk about the last episode feedback, we'll get into some more specifics, because it's a follow-up also from the previous episode. But yes, there are harbors as well in the game. It exists. Yeah, harbors exist. Moving on. If you're in England, you should build them. Harbors exist. They got a slap buff. They don't suck quite so bad. Well, I mean, we already talked in the last episode about all the harbor buffs. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's covered. All right, Aerodome. Uh, I, I finally have seen an one. AI build one. But did they place any planes in there, though? Yeah. <gasps> wait, 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 they used it? And, and it was funny because they actually placed the Aerodome in a good location. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. That What's must wrong have been coincidence. AI? Totally coincidence, I'm sure. But <laughs> <laughs> when I looked at it, I'm like, wow, that actually makes sense from a gameplay perspective. Weird. How unusual. <laughs> yeah, that must be wrong. At a certain point in the game when it's, oh, wow, this AI is really strong. But by really strong, I mean it has really good city defensive strength, even though they have no units on the map. <sighs> oh, what's that? I can't bombard from the coast? Oh, okay. Well, let's get some bombers in here. <laughs> and they are a nice substitute to, say, battleships on the coast to bombard those defenses down so you can come in and take the city, which is then just a mere matter of marching. Typically, an aerodome, that's all you need. It's like, oh, but if I could construct a hangar, I could go from four units to six. <sighs> okay, there might be certain situations where you're going to want that, because based on the area you're at and the place that you want to bomb, you can only reach it from one that particular location, so six is better than four. But usually at that point, it's just... I feel like I don't have anything else to build in the city right now, and it would be nice, and it gives something for the city to do. Uh, but <laughs> Why are you wasting time on an aerodrome? I already identified a situation why, in fact, it wouldn't be a waste. I don't know. There's just the AI's and air stuff just isn't ready. Even if the AI does get an aerodrome up, it really doesn't affect whether or not I get air forces myself. Like, I don't feel that impetus to like have a counter air force. I don't either. The aerodrome to me is all about the bombers to go after the cities that I can't bombard from the coast. At a certain point where I'm concerned, like, oh, I could move some siege units there, but it's, oh, did it just get wiped out because of the city's the strength on one hit? Oh, crap, that's, that's too bad. Okay, well, here, have a bomber. Well, it seemed fitting that, I don't know, we ended on talking about a district that allows you to construct and store units. Speaking of units... <laughs> oh boy. Well, there's also uh, promotions in Civ 6, folks. I know it's a surprise. And we were thinking about talking about this like a few months ago, but we decided to do it now instead. Well, if Firaxis and 2K would coordinate <laughs> their updates to Civ 6 with us a little more, then maybe we could have talked about this sooner. But, you know, they still ignore my emails, so. <sighs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> In general, some stuff is pretty obviously good. One thing that might not be apparent if you're just starting out with a game, I guess, is that the uh, district bonuses also apply to cities. So uh, strength in those or against those is helpful. <laughs> more so than you, you might the, think if you're just looking at it. You mean more the city center district? Well, yes. yes. The city center yeah. itself is a district. It took me like a couple days to realize that that was the case. So I'm like, man, these promotions suck. Like, I'm not going to put a sword in a, <laughs> a district. Like, what What the heck? <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's not just like attacking enemy encampment districts or something. That, that's a more useful promotion than it looks at first glance. Aside from that, though, the stuff that improves your combat strength against the units you most typically fight and the city district or district stuff in general, pretty good promotions. Uh, you should probably not take things like the two-hander promotion on melee units that's good against anti-cavalry units because those things blow and your basic melee units will steamroll them anyway. But uh, yeah, maybe if it's the last promotion available. Incendiaries on range is good if you're pressing city-states early with archers, I guess. 
I'll say with the ranged, the final promotion with the plus one additional attack per turn, if the unit has not moved, is delicious, because of course now that effectively, for bombarding purposes, counts as two units, which depending upon the city you're going after, it's like, oh, I've only got room to bombard with like three or four units, but if you're using your promotions strategically, and part of that is a consideration of, I could take that promotion right now, but the promotion that I could get would be, say, versus land units, the first tier at volley, except I'm going after the city. So I am also concerned about, on the turn rollover, that they're going to attack this unit, and I have no ability to heal otherwise. It's like, it's not sitting on a farm, so it's not going to be able to pillage to heal. I'm worried about getting it squished. So at times, I think there's an advantage to delaying the promotion. You don't want to delay it too long. You just don't want to be gaining that experience. But that can be used as like, oh, did you think you were going to take out that unit? Actually, no. I'm now going to use that promotion less for the effect, but rather the fact that it can stay uh, on the yes. map and or in the vicinity because, hey, I just I just got healing at the same time. Yes, there is promotional healing back from Civ 4, so you can store hit points in essence yeah. that way. Yeah. Otherwise, say with a, with a recon unit with your scout, it's like, oh... Congratulations, you just discovered a natural wonder, for instance. Which one are you going to choose? Are you going to do faster movements in woods and jungle terrain or faster movement on hill terrain? Pay attention <laughs> to the map and see, hmm, what type of terrain do you have around you? And if you have lots of hills or have seen a lot of hills, then perhaps you want to go with that one as opposed to the one for um, woods and jungle. Knowledge of the map script might be a hint, too. Yep. Just saying. Exactly. Typically, my recon units, they don't get much farther than that because that they die. Uh, I'm really not one constructing uh, rangers later on in the game, so I'm specifically talking about scouts here, but I suppose they could get all the way to, like, only adjacent enemy units can reveal this unit. A camouflage, it's like, I've never seen a recon unit promoted that much, but it is definitely possible. Phil mentioned melee, talked about range. Anti-cav, yeah, well... That unit class just needs work. Yeah, we don't have anything to say about that, or even light cavalry units or heavy cavalry units. Well, those are good units, but they're not, like... Um, you don't need usually anti-cavalry promotions on like cavalry. I mean, you, I guess you could if you're fighting someone who builds only spears, but you'd probably just want to build a couple melee units then. Yeah. So yeah, you, you take the better promotion typically. Certainly, you want to be thinking about long term, but short term should be the immediate priority because you're using these in the field probably, and you want them to survive to get to the long term. So if say you're using an archer or a crossbowman and you're currently using it to go after cities constantly and it gets a promotion, how about the additional combat strength when defending as compared to land units? Whereas if it's, uh, I'm trying to get rid of these units in order to get to the city, then okay, I want the additional combat strength versus land units. Well, keep in mind, too, that that's more of a two-sided path than you get with like a standard melee unit. If you're pressing cities, the right side of that path makes more sense in general, because you also get the incendiaries promotion down that side, and you, then you can push into the double attack later. You're resisting city shots better, and you're doing more damage to the cities. That promotion line just makes more sense for a, something that you're using to attack cities. And then there's also for uh, naval melee and naval ranged with... Naval melee, yes, there's the additional combat strength versus um, naval units, and there's the sight range, etc. I usually find that I would very much like to get to, first off, say, reinforced hull, so you got a combat strength when defending versus uh, ranged attacks, which you know can include city center if they've got walls and camps, etc., or other units that are going after your naval melee units, which could also include land-based range units that can reach that. But then you can get yourself to auxiliary ships, which is healing outside of friendly territory, which is very nice. I mean, you might say, well, if you're going on a spree with the naval melee units, then you're going to have your own territory, so what do you really need that for? Well, yes, it's also, again, situational. This is kind of like the front line that you're pushing onto this continent somewhere else on the map, then that can be very friendly to have because you don't have to worry about backtracking to your home territory in order to be able to heal if you feel that you're going to need to do that in order for it to survive to be able to do something. Naval ranged units? I typically, again, those for me, going after artificial intelligence specifically, it's going after cities. So the combat strength versus district defenses is... That initial line, you got plus seven combat, and then you can get 
After that, there's Rolling Barrage, which gives you more combat strength versus those district defenses. And then that itself will roll into healing outside of friendly territory, and you might even get yourself into plus one range, which is, hey, I've got a battleship. Yeah, it goes four hexes in land instead of three. Time back to a previous topic. Oh, I guess I'm going to need to worry about some aerodomes and some bombers. I'll just use my battleships. Thank you very much. Assuming that there's water on the map, of course. <laughs> yeah, I was say. <laughs> and then, okay, yeah, I guess there are promotions for fighter units and bomber units, but assuming you get to those things, which isn't particularly very often, again, are you going more after units on the map? Or are you going more after city defenses? And consider accordingly. It's very nice in the game that it will show you the complete promotion path for those units once you get to a promotion or a subsequent promotion and you can see the connections between the two so you can plan out in your mind okay this is what i want or need now this is where i see this unit going in the future and you can do that for every specific unit it's not oh i guess i need to always adopt this first siege unit nope this siege unit does this is the siege unit does that and if you're wondering Oh my gosh, I can't remember which siege unit has which promotion. Uh, I wish it was a little easier to see on the screen, but there are little icons on the unit name. You click on it, you hover over, and it reminds you of what the name of the promotion is and what the effect is. And of course, there's also the joy of promoting a unit of the second promotion that you get to name it. I find it often humorous, the randomness of the suggested names that have already been built into the game. Sometimes they're appropriate, and sometimes they're, I'll say inappropriate, but just kind of out there. I think the Widowmakers is the uh, <laughs> the one that comes to mind. It's like, whoa, but you can type anything in there that you want. <laughs> there's other good ones. Oh, you're thinking of an, another suggested promotion name that the game has? Oh, please tell us. No. That's a really weird name for a unit. <laughs> I, I, is, you know, but sure, why not? No. <laughs> yeah. No, not for you. But speaking of units, we uh, had some feedback a few episodes ago. So from episode 276 and obsoleting units... Northern Light wrote in, or posted something somewhere, I don't know. Cause... Yeah, it was during the live stream of the episode. Oh, right, yeah. They should change the way upkeep works. I think upkeep should not be unit-specific, but based on the era the player is in. It's not a perfect solution, but having these obsolete units around is, question mark, stupid? I'm guessing the, he's looking at the more obsolete it is, the more you pay for it in upkeep. I think he wants, as you progress in eras, your older stuff also just costs more. Yeah. Just because you move forward. Not that it costs more because they're old, just because just you move more. into newer era, you have more upkeep. You can make a realism argument for that. I can't even believe I just said that out loud. But it's like, okay, we're having yeah. a hard time getting parts for this now, so... <laughs> yeah, it's going to cost yeah, more. Guess. You could do something like, like, you know, we have these things called guns. <laughs> and muskets so yeah we've kind of converted all our factories over to building those rather than those old swords <laughs> and clubs and stuff i mean we could still use a gun as a stick i suppose in you know an extreme situation but smack them with it that's not really what they're designed for <laughs> well muskets did come with big pointy sticks because bayonets, bayonets yes they did come, yeah because then that replaced the pike but you don't see that in game <laughs> No. <laughs> but you need to fix the anti-cap unit <laughs> line in general to make it work. The space between unit upgrades is really thin. Yeah. Like, I built horsemen! Woohoo! I get to use these for, what, classical through industrial <laughs> before I can upgrade it. And there's nothing that boosts them in between, so look at me! I'm using horsemen, and they get wrecked. One shotted. Oh well. So I was reading his comment differently. I was reading as like having the upkeep almost lower, or actually, I'll, it would be cool to have a button where you could just be like, anybody at this range, upgrade them if they're within my borders, rather than having to do individuals. Well, no, I, th- I think he is, at least the way I'm reading it, forcing people to not keep obsolete units around because they are paying more for them. So if you're going to pay the same amount in upkeep for a warrior versus, say, a musket, then it might would as make well upgrade. Sense. Yeah, might as well upgrade. Of course, the AI will go and upgrade anyways, and most players will upgrade anyways. So Aside from maybe their uh, scout bog busting network. 
Though I will say the notion of, okay, so uh, now I can upgrade my crossbow into field cannons. Yeah, oh, I've got ten of these. Now I need to click on each one of these individually. Yeah, if they're all inside your territory, click on one, have a button that's like, upgrade just this one, or why don't we upgrade all of them if you've got the gold in one single click? That would reduce some micro. I like this idea. Yeah, but I don't think that's really what he was going for. No, that's definitely not what Northern Light was going for at all. This is just the side base of what Callie said. Yeah, that'd be a fine UI bump. <laughs> upgrade all. Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily want to mass upgrade in some circumstances, especially if you're fighting a war and... You want yeah, to that's it. true. I know sometimes I'll put like a unit to sleep and then forget where it was <laughs> well, when I'm yeah, playing like really, problem. really long games. An arrow later. Oh, where'd this guy come from? <laughs> it's lucky though if you like in older versions where you just like sit them in your city and you're like, oh hey, I've had a defensive bonus for how long? And an amenity bonus if you throw that policy in. Mm-hmm. On episode 278, we had some feedback on Civilization Fanatic Center. It was nice to see the conversation, even where we weren't necessarily agreeing with what was being said specifically, the fact that people take the time to provide the feedback, whether it's constructive criticism, suggestions, compliments, somewhere in between. We appreciate all of that. We very much like to engage with the audience, and uh, I don't often do this on this show, but I feel I would be remiss not to thank Majin for also joining in on this thread in addition to myself. But it's also nice when people who listen to the show start talking to each other about what we talk about on the show. We don't actually have to say anything. We just help build the momentum, provide that base. Kind of three tracks on here. There was the constructive criticism about the show itself. There were compliments about the show itself. And then there was specifically this question with regards to harbors where someone thought that we felt that harbors should give people the ability to defend like encampments because we were likening harbors to encampments. Then that also extended into what exactly a harbor is going to look like. And Matt, you were more involved in that part of the conversation than I was. Yeah, spun out from where I was suggesting to split out the harbor stuff into actual naval build versus economic side, just because it's in a weird position of having to try and do both. There's people who agreed with that concept and went a little bit further. Casper suggested potentially splitting it out into a separate district for the naval base, but that has a problem of more districts. On that point, Casper said that, while I do realize there's a risk of district overload in the game, given how most ocean tiles sit around doing nothing anyway, I think this would be a better solution. Did I miss where he specifically connected naval base and ocean tiles? Like, what was the connection between that? connection is that you put harbors in the water <laughs> i think well ocean is also water <laughs> so well you mean harbors go in the shallow water and the naval base goes into ocean into deeper water well no it'd be shallow water too probably okay so yes back to my point what was the ocean comment i think he was just talking ocean in general is it like maybe not, the, if you had harbor specific. it would enhance the ocean tiles near that city because you're actually making better use of them because you have a harbor there for boats to go in and out Assuming those ocean tiles were also within your cultural borders? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you don't work things outside your cultural borders. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like you said a thing that this city gets a bonus on ocean and coast tiles if it has harbor. Well, or building ah. in the harbor. Victoria argued that the way it is is just fine, and that's possible. I mean, I'm not really agreeing with that from a design perspective. I think it's kind of a mixed mag. Victoria is, plays a lot of England, so it's the Royal Navy Dockyard rather than uh, an actual straight-up harbor. So a lot of Victoria's comments are based on how yeah, the Royal Navy Dockyard better. is much stronger. And, well, yeah, that's fine. It's a unique harbor. It's now much stronger with the latest patch. But that's not everybody's harbor. That's my only point I would take in consideration based on what Victoria was writing, is that everybody's harbor is a little different than what uh, you get for England. And Shaq Leo had said that, no, for me, the harbor should supplement those yields, quote-unquote. That's the gold from a commercial hub, a production from an industrial zone, and food from granary and or watermill. Yeah, yeah, no, there's some suggestions like, oh, you want more production build at an industrial center? But they're like, that, no. <laughs> that doesn't make the harbor any better or worse by building other things. You're building those other things to get those other bonuses. I mean, yeah, yeah, there is a benefit of the fact that you don't have to build a city on the coast to get the harbor, but that doesn't make the harbor any better or worse on its bonuses. Yeah, because the harbor is supported by the city and the city center district. 
regardless of where that is, so long as it's been a few hexes off the coast and you can construct the harbor, but the harbor itself isn't going anywhere else. It's just the city that's located differently, whether it's on the coast or not. Yeah, Shaglio started talking about separating out the shipyard from lighthouse and seaport because it got a little weird being able to build a shipyard without building the lighthouse first. My only comment on that one was that you'd have a bit of a problem because every other district in the game and the way it's coded effectively is that you need to build the first building, then you can build the second building. That would be a bit of a problem if uh, you were able to skip one of those buildings because it affects other things like pillaging of districts for one. It affects, uh, I mean, just the game, the way it's built. They'd have to make a major exception on the code for, say, building stack. Because then you could start arguing, well, maybe I don't want a library. Maybe all I want is universities everywhere. Yes. Certainly, if you're going to go down the path of the prerequisites for buildings in district, you could just look at that for one district, but that would be a mistake. Whether or not that would be a good thing to be able to say oh, okay, let's just go ahead and have a shipyard, we don't need a lighthouse, or let's go ahead and have a university and a campus, but not a library. That's opening up a whole other set of considerations with regards to the game mechanics, as you're saying. We're moving to a completely separate consideration now. Elsewise, in terms of content from the discussion on CFC in response to episode 278, there was a brief aside from Victoria about that we took the completely wrong tack on diplomacy. When a Civ says, I like your science output, all it's doing is saying I am a technophile, and so you have plus six with me. The fact that you have minus 30 with them and that they will denounce you makes perfect sense to me. It's just a useful informational message unless, uh, you know, you have gone in on with the warmonger thing there. The thing that I said in response was, our juxtaposition was strictly the point, counterpoint of both a positive and negative modifier, where the negative modifier comes out on top, no other modifiers were in consideration, so specifically in regards to the agendas, the known agenda and the hidden agenda, where it's, hey, we like you for this agenda. Oh, we dislike you for this agenda. So, on balance, I guess, you know, hate is a stronger emotion, so therefore we hate you. Ouch. We didn't really get into the point where, I like you for being a technophile next turn. I hate you because you're not tacking up. No. Or we don't get into the, ah, oh, look at this, plus 10, plus 6, plus 8, plus this. Minus 134, you're a warmonger. Uh, <laughs> wait a yeah. minute now. Well, it's less than previous patches. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it's true. I have seen it as high as a minus 180. Well, you should stop warmongering then. No, you should keep warmongering because now the further bonuses or penalties don't matter. Just kill everything. That's the correct answer. Look, Matt, if I stop warmongering, then they're going to start to get confused with themselves. And then they've <laughs> already decided, so I might I might as well yeah. accuse to something. I might as well just do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the spirit. Kill everything. <laughs> including if you're going to call me a dirty warmonger, I will show you what, exactly what a dirty warmonger is. On separate occasions on this episode, I've managed to both agree with Magin and Phil. I'm not sure what's happening, Mac. You save us all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why? What, 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 what? How are you? Uh, Why you agree with these things? Stop agreeing with things. Things, huh? <laughs> I'll remember that later, Mackie. <laughs> Don't get too mad when we start going to the objectifying the comments, because you just made me an object. <laughs> and I love it. Because now I have a Cass's belly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, as for other comments, apparently we joke around too much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oops. Well, well I, I would even go farther than that, that apparently we complain too much. According to Demon Master, he stopped listening some time ago because it had become too much of who can thrash the most pod. Maybe bad timing that I decided to listen to this episode, I don't know. It's a fine line between criticizing and discussion and thrashing and whining. That's okay. Forums and other social medias is, is full of these behaviors. I have grown tired of it. I'm sure that others find you entertaining to listen to. If we were just, this is crap, and this is crap, and this is crap, and we, first off, no constructive criticism in terms of a suggestion on how to improve it, or also balance it with, we dislike this, but we also like that, then okay, to me that's thrashing. But I did say that disappointed that you found our approach to discussing the latest Civilization Six patch to be one that doesn't present criticism constructively, or at least constructively enough, because I tried to get from Demon Master what part of the episode, or parts of the episode he was talking about specifically, and I said, you know, I appreciated the fact that you listened to the show for the first time in a few years after stopping for the same reason. If you listen to the entire episode and that's the conclusion you drew, then fine. But I think you were shortchanging yourself if you just listened to one topic of one episode for the first time in a few years and decided that, oh, this reinforces my affirmation about the show that I established before. 
Maggle did say that our little diplomatic annoyances that apparently bothered us for one reason or another went on for a very, very long time. Quote, like, okay, that we get that you think diplomacy needs some work, but the dozen plus examples were probably a bit excessive. Once you got past that part, it was more interesting, though. And I just said, we were all individually jumping in on examples of why diplomacy needs work. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you've got a little tangenty there, so I said I can understand, you know, a less is more here, but uh, glad they enjoyed the lesson otherwise. I think that was pretty measured. But we also had some positive, outright positive comments, which was very much appreciated. There was a lot of keep up the good work, keep it up, cast us some pretty good balance. I think it shows that you love the franchise, but don't take it or yourselves too seriously either. It's a nice alternative or supplement to reading the forums or watching videos of gameplay. It sounds like we play a lot of the game and are passionate about it and make good suggestions to improve it. That's from uh, Sasquid and Odalie. Captain Unknown just started binge listening to the show, having just gotten into podcasts. Oh, that's dangerous. You really should seek the advice of a doctor on how much you can binge listen to the show without adversely affecting your health. Uh, <laughs> adversely? No way. <laughs> your sides might be sort of laughing at us. And then from OK Librarian, put me down as a fan of the show. I've listened on and off over the years, but become a regular in the run-up to Civ Six. There's a perpetual balancing act between supporting the brand you love enough to podcast about, providing honest feedback to fans, and keeping your minor fame... That's in quotation marks. In perspective, I think the Polycast team threads that needle well. Well said. Not just because it's in support of the show, but also, <laughs> well, obviously that too, but well said. So thanks to all who contributed to this thread constructively. Yeah. I mean, there were some statements in there about certain co-hosts about whether or not coming a bit condescending, which is maybe a little true depending on the week. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has their topics and issues that they're passionate about. <laughs> yeah. Although I'm wondering if Sad Squid got Phil and I mixed up, but okay. <laughs> oh, we have each been, depending on the uh, game in question and the episode in question, we've each been pretty critical, depending. Yeah. Because, <laughs> like, I, I wasn't a big fan of Beyond Earth, but you're outright trolled by mentions of it, so. <laughs> 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 yeah, I get triggered. <laughs> I was just about to say Amy is more or less triggered in this way. Ah, get it yeah, that's not to say I think it's a good game, because I don't, but uh, <laughs> I think you dislike it more than me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's other times. Like, I have real problems with certain aspects of Civ 6. So, yeah, I'm going to come off strongly in some episodes because of that. Oh, yeah. We do have to keep an eye on that to not get too cranky. I think there's also a comment in there that sometimes when one of us is a regular panelist, goes off on something that sometimes it then affects the rest of us for that episode and our responses and what we're saying and how we're saying it, but they don't hold it against us. Well, I think he meant... Uh, and the people around you influence <laughs> you, yes. That's, uh, I wasn't going to mention yeah. anyone specifically. I wasn't even going to allude but yes, you. to those specific comments. Well, I mean, it's entirely Mackie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. I mean, basically, yeah, Mackie sure. sets the mood and everything we do and say... Uh, as a result of her influence. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We want to at least create the illusion that we're our own people, but really, Mackie's the one who's influencing what we say. Yeah. What? So I guess to be fair to the post-edit listening people, it's entirely Dan's fault for cutting out all the stuff that we said that <laughs> actually gives context <laughs> to the stuff you don't like. Uh, uh, you, now, now, okay, Matt. All right. Yeah, you want to hear some complaining. Just, just listen to the unedited stuff. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're going to put that throw down? That's fine. Imagine made a specific comment about, thing like, I don't know if Dan left this in, but such and such. And as was pointed out, yes, Dan left that in. <laughs> so I am very conscious of what I am keeping in, in terms of particularly when it's rage, something that's negative or even something that's positive, that if I keep in the emotion, but I don't keep in the content or part of the content for context, then it's going to make someone come off sounding a little different than they intended. I'd like to think I'm pretty good at maintaining that, despite the apparent consternation here that I do not. <laughs> but in terms of just the editing the episode full stop, fine, I will take full responsibility for that. <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying here is don't yeah. just criticize part of the product that I edit. Criticize the whole thing, okay? Uh, wait, what? No. Uh... Yeah, full criticism, yeah. gotcha. That can be arranged. <laughs> yep. So, I'm pretty sure Dan does a good job at editing. Yes. Oh. <laughs> we just try not to give him anything good to edit. <laughs> we try to make his life more miserable, is what he's saying. <laughs> Our 
recorded for episode 272 with Dan Q, Makalua, the Mian team, and Majin. And now Dan's long con. His name is not actually Daniel Quick. Hold <laughs> <laughs> along, he's just been posing as that guy from Canada. He's not actually. Yeah. He might actually be Dan, but his last name isn't really Quick. Nope. Mm. You know, simplicity and you're lying there. It'd be awesome. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes, it's true. I, I'm actually Spartacus. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> in 2016, Civilization VI was a platinum seller, and Civilization V, six years since its initial vanilla release, was at silver. So, yay, Civ. To be more specific on that, Civ VI had exactly two months, or three months, true, worth of yes. the year. So, in one-fourth of the year, it outsold most other stuff on Steam. Yeah. There's also the question of people have bought it, but are they still playing it? Well, and I know from some perspectives, was... it's we already have your money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in the case of No Man's Sky. <laughs> yeah, based on gross revenue, not net, and definitely not number. Definitely not. <laughs> Civ Five was in the top 30 sales by gross revenue for 2016. It's so even based on Civ Five and its gross revenue, and given the fact that it's been on sale more often than not for a buck, it's actually pretty yeah. solid. And again, there hasn't been any official updates to it in, what, about for a little more than three years? So, yeah. well done. <laughs> and it's not like yeah. Civ Five had dropped off the map in terms of sales in 2014 or 2015 either. So, nope. way to go! Recorded for episode 262 with Dan Q, Makalua, the me and team. Majin and Blauerfackle. The channel White Lightning HQ put out a, an absolutely hilarious video called uh, Civ 5 I'm Not Invading. This is some really hilarious stuff for anybody who's been into the Civ game. A little over two minutes long. Two guys going back and forth and how that can all go to hell. <laughs> Great day today, isn't it? Get out! But I'm just standing here. No, no you're not. Nobody just stands out in the open for fun. Who else is out there? Just me. Alright, look. I've got a gun in front of me and a warmongering nation behind me, so if you don't leave, I will attack first. But if you attack me, you'll declare war on my entire country. Are you not listening to me? War, we monger it. But I'm not attacking you, I'm just standing here. So stop standing there! It's from the same group that also gave us uh, the Gandhi attacking, as well as the uh, Civilization V science victory. These are people who have played the game, or if they haven't played the game, they've read about and talked to people who've played the game and paid really, really close attention. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're getting into the nitty-gritty that only somebody who's actually played hours and hours and hours of this game will not only immediately identify with, but probably laugh or maybe gnaw through something. <laughs> hey, this guy is standing in our borders. Anybody care at all? No? I'm just a missionary. I'm not invading you. We don't want your religion. We already have denouncing Venice, and I'm on the fence about that one. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and uh, I don't want to risk my chance of getting into boat heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I'm on the fence about that one, seeing as how you can view like the border as the fence as well, which is <laughs> just like... <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, hecky, hecky, hecky. Recorded for episode 273 with Dan Q. Makalua. Me and team, and Majin. It's another one of those funny videos with the live action. It's about builders versus workers, and uh, some of their differences. Gotta I was amused, it. so it was okay. <laughs> it was published by Door Monster, formerly White Lightning NQ, who had all of those Civilization Five videos that we talked about last year that were also live action. Again, these people play the game, or they research it really well. And they fake having played the game. Either way. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, uh, the end result is great. I would almost be more impressed if they were able to make videos like that without having played the game ever. People are like, I'm sorry, I don't have a very good attention span. Well, this is only two and a half minutes. And if you don't have a very good attention span, why are you listening to the show? There's 235,000 views as of this recording. If you want something repetitive, I can put you on repair duty. The Northern Mine is on fire right now. I just put that out this morning. If you want to complain to the barbarians, they're probably still there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Door Monster, who do a lot of, like, Civ 5, Civ 6 spoof videos, and you've probably seen some of them before when they've discussed the Great War, and they're, each character is, like, their own Civ, and they're talking about that. And then, but they have this one um, called Breaking News, 
Scythia has taken military action against four city-states, and two of them have been captured since I started talking. I actually really enjoyed it because it's one of those things that sometimes you just don't really pay attention to when city-states are getting attacked, and then all of a sudden, a army is at your door. That's right, an entire new chunk of land has been found, and you'll never guess what it's full of unless you guess barbarians. There are so many that they seem to have formed their own civilization, which they call Sumeria. Published on the 20th of March, 180,000 views as of this recording. So have four minutes in length. Sorry, we have breaking news. The scout that died in the barbarian attack is available for a promotion. Some point out that the scout is, as we mentioned, dead. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, some little cleanup. <laughs> Whoops. Breaking news. The leader of Japan has fallen unconscious and been replaced by an artificial intelligence. Nope, he's back. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this is obviously a parody of all the notification system and stuff like that. And what people pay attention to or not. Yeah. So yeah, it was this a good one. Should have been a builder. I could have been retired by now. Why are there barbarians in here? Breaking news. Unit killed. Support the ongoing Polycast Patreon campaign. Collective achievements. Personal incentives. Month to month commitment. For more information, visit the polycast.net slash Patreon. Call in today. In North America, 301-637-7659. In Europe, 44-121-288-7659. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. Log on to the series' official website at thepolycast.net. So, uh, hey, Kelly, yeah. bring your first episode? Yeah, no, it's been fun. I'm, I'm listening more than I'm talking, which is probably not a good thing. But uh, it's been fun listening to you guys go back and forth on everything. You know, I would say it's different being on an episode than listening to an episode. But seeing as how you hadn't done either of those before we started today, <laughs> I don't know. You know what? Uh, <laughs> not sure what to say. I've been busy. I've been so busy. <laughs> it was on my list to do, and then I was just uh, work. But um, anyway, okay. should I wrap other anyway. things up? Yeah. yeah. Right. It's a little early for Christmas, but okay. No, it's Easter. Not that. Where's my bunny? Bunny's right here. Bunny's tapping a mic. Bunny says hi. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this has been episode 279 of Polycast. I'm Michael Lua, and I'm here with the usual suspect, Stan Q. Ball of fluff. Imagine. Sacrificing bunny for Easter. <laughs> uh, me and team. I'll just hop on over to your territory. <laughs> And I guess today, Kelly and Ed, uh, uh, God, now I'm messing up. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Mackie decided, you know what? It's not just going to be my name that gets mispronounced. I'm going to do it in turn. Oh, good God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think Mackie was just flummoxed. Oh, my gosh, there's another woman on the panel. It's been so long. <laughs> Probably. Wait, wait, what? What? <laughs> oh, oh, Kalina. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. And that's Makalua, right? You got her to show up. That would be even better. Okay, so this is what you do. Say Mackie, Mackie, Mackie three times. Purple, though, like... Have I made the perfect something entry up. time again? Welcome to Polycast number 279 for the week of April 15th. Hi, Mackie fan. <laughs> Oh, God. Sorry. <laughs> Apparently, the Mackie fan has decided I am not speaking fast enough, so... So, hey, we've been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. Who wants to talk about Civ 6 buildings? No, put it off. Next topic. No. No, 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 no. Sorry. First topic, yeah, we can do the same thing away, for promotions so... and other topics, and then just not have an episode. That's great. Exactly. <laughs> we, we could do that, but... We could. No, we're not. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that last topic was supposed to be somebody else's. You did all the talking, and um, maybe she can do this one. Well, I mean, Callie introduced it, and then we ran with it after that. See, Callie made the mistake of asking us what we thought. 
Now she knows not to ask us that question. <laughs> All right. Well, fine. I'll introduce. Um... And tell us what you think about it. Record date April 15th, 2017. Sip 6 Parody Clips, Copyright Door Monster. Copyright Civilized Communication at civcom.net.